Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Carissa Miller. I'm the Executive Director of the Council of Chief State School Officers, and I'm so pleased to be joined by Superintendent Jillian Balo of Wyoming, uh, Superintendent Hansel Kang of the District of Columbia, and Superintendent Carrie Wright of Mississippi. I want to first start out by thanking the Reagan Institute for inviting all of us. Uh, we're so happy to be a part of the work uh, that, uh, that you do and to be a part of this conference again this year. So thank you so much for that. We started the conference today with some uh, a wonderful video and quotes uh, that were so moving. Uh, one that really struck me was that what joins us is bigger than what divides us. Uh, and we've seen that as state chiefs over and over again throughout this, uh, this pandemic. Uh, and the work that has gone on by each of the chiefs that are here today and all of the, uh, the members of CCSSO. The conference theme is lifting state leadership. And I have to say that uh, our state leaders have risen to this challenge. Uh, they have uh, met the needs for kids. And we're gonna hear a little bit about that today. We have a very short session. We're gonna do a rapid fire on what the last uh, seven, eight months has been like in a really so I'm going to get started really quickly, and Hansel, I'm going to come to you first. If you could know some of the priorities and actions, the partners that you had during this time, how did you address uh, the needs of, of students during this time? Yeah, thanks, Carissa. Um, so I think, obviously, as we all adjusted to the pandemic in the early days, there was a lot of um, hurried activity because there were so many needs to meet. Um, so my agency worked really quickly to um, stand up emergency child care for the District of Columbia for healthcare workers and essential government employees. Um, we worked to issue lots of guidance to people who were trying to figure out um, what do graduation requirements look like for our graduating seniors? What do instructional calendar requirements look like? What do special education requirements look like? Um, but I think it was also really helpful to step back over the summer once we were able to catch our breaths a little bit and to realize that um, so much of the important work we've been doing before the pandemic were still the right areas of work that we needed to do going forward as well. Um, we might just need to think about what it looked like a little bit differently. And so it was helpful to stay rooted in our strategic plan that we created as an agency um, to still think about what it meant to set high expectations, to build ecosystem capacity, to share and use actionable data, um, and just think about how we might need to adjust what those things look like in the context of the pandemic. Thanks, Hansel. And Carrie, I'd, I'd ask you the same question in a framing of how Mississippi addressed some of these and, and some of the critical partners um, in your state and, and otherwise. Well, we had a great collaboration with our state health officer, our state epidemiologist, our governor's office. Um, there wasn't a time that we weren't really in communication with each other. And the state health officer in particular, uh, we held calls at least twice a week. He was always seeking my advice. I was seeking his. He put out a decision matrix, if you will, uh, for schools. So to kind of help them with decision making as things were, what do we do now? What do we do now? And uh, and that that really morphed into uh, a different kind of piece of documentation uh, as time went on. And as Hansel just said, things were happening so fast and we were just trying to get as much information out as we could, but he, he was a tremendous partner. And the other thing that we really partnered with was our superintendents. Um, I got a group of them together um, to say, okay, now that we're in the middle of this, what is your best thinking around the areas of academics and school operations and transportation and food services? So they were really trying to gear up for the fall. So it was really all of us in this together, to be very honest with you. And, and I got to say hats off to CCSSO because you brought us all together twice a week uh, for us to share with each other. And we, it's, it's different when you're out there by yourself, but when you've got key partners around you, um, it makes work a lot easier. So CCSSO really did a lot to help lift our leadership. Thank you, Carrie. And Jillian, you're serving as the president of uh, the board for CCSSO this year. Uh, and you have many of the things that Hansel and Carrie have talked about, but there's also this local context and Wyoming uh, has some, some different things going on. Can you share with us some of those, uh, the leadership in your state? Yeah, um, thanks, Carissa. And you know, as, as Carrie oh. and Hansel both, both noted, um, we all have similar but different experiences. And, um, you know, I, I know in, in Wyoming, we, um, 
we approach some of those uh, some of those challenges a little bit differently. Um, we immediately made sure that kids had food. We immediately made sure that we were standing up an infrastructure for broadband and device access across our um, our rural state. Um, we immediately tried to meet the needs of students. And if you know, as educators, we're kind of trained to always go back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And um, and I found myself sort of um, constructing this Maslow's educational hierarchy of needs as well, and um, making sure that we we met um, students' social emotional learning where it was at, um, making sure that we focused on essential learnings, uh, understanding that we would probably be out of school for the remainder of the 1920 school year, and um, you know, so just responding uh, very similarly, but different depending on our dynamics. And I, I have to just underscore what Carrie said um, in, in that we really relied on each other and the vehicle for um, setting up conversations with other state chiefs was CCSSO from the very beginning. And there were a lot of days when I think we just looked at each other on Zoom a little bit shell-shocked. And, um, and then we started immediately thinking of what are our next steps? What are the best practices? What are the lessons learned? What are you trying um, that I could maybe adapt to my own state? And, uh, you know, I'd also just underscore what Carrie noted in, in the partnerships with the state epidemiologist, the governor's office, and so many others. And it was not only a wonderful opportunity to lead alongside educators, but also to lead alongside other state leaders. Um, and, and in the case of the state epidemiologist, maybe someone that we hadn't had a lot of contact with before March. Yeah, I, I'm proud to say that CCSSO provides social and emotional uh, support for chiefs. So that's, <laughs> yes. that's, that's an important piece of what we do and, uh, and, and is also part of what we uh, strive to do. So you mentioned the meals and I, I'm going to pull out themes on innovation as we go along here because we had to get innovative about how to deliver meals to kids um, and there were numerous ways in which that happened. Um, I'm going to also just move us to the next question and you guys can talk about some of the ways in which you delivered meals. But when we think about parents and students and the, you know, we're, we entered into opening the school year and I, I was joking as we got on here that I had to like, you know, tell my household to shut down the internet so that uh, I didn't get interrupted. So, you know, my child who's learning online, sorry, not today. It's not true. She's the only one that can have internet right now. But it, it's a struggle for parents. It's a struggle for students. And can you talk to us about the ways in which you at the, at the state level are working to mitigate that and how you're helping support that? Carrie, I'll come to you first. Sure. Um, we immediately um, started working with our legislature. Um, they were in session. And we knew very, very early on that there were children that had connectivity and children that did not. And so our legislature um, was very, very generous to us. They gave us over $200 million. Uh, we now have a digital learning plan uh, that we're executing on to ensure that every child has a device and every teacher has a device. Uh, we gave them an option of the devices. So we also have uh, money for connectivity. Uh, and so districts that are, have more connectivity decided how they wanted to use that, whether it was hotspots or whether it was um, more broadband, if they were able data plans, that kind of thing that they were able to do. Uh, the plan also includes professional development, not only for our teachers and leaders, but for our parents, because we were hearing from parents, I don't know how to do this. And uh, so we knew we needed to, to pivot to that as well. But the other part that we built into this, uh, in addition to that, are the high, high quality instructional materials, so that parents would have access to that, children would have access to that. And we also added a whole piece around telehealth and teletherapy so that we could extend that across our state. We've got a lot of areas of our state that don't have enough access. And so there, uh, you talk about partnership. When I brought that up, the Medical Association, the Pediatric Association, the State University Hospital, everybody wanted to get on board so that we could do this in a very thoughtful way. That's fantastic. And I, I wanted to strive home the point about the professional development because we can, it, we still have issues on the, uh, the digital divide, uh, vast ones, and we all acknowledge that and there are things that we're working on to do that. But it's not just about devices and internet, it's also about the professional development and it's about um, high quality materials. Jillian, can you talk a little bit about, you and I've talked about um, the digital divide in Wyoming and some of the work mm -hmm. you're doing there, but also what you're doing with parents and students in Wyoming. 
And you know, earlier today, uh, Dr. Rice, um, a wonderful conversation that that, uh, that she um, she participated in, and she noted that Americans really should be questioning right now the trade-offs that we're being asked um, to make uh, with respect to COVID-19. And we see that play out societally and politically in a lot of ways, but it's also playing out in every single home across America in a deeply personal and emotional way um, from joy to grief to sadness to anger and frustration on a daily basis. So I think first and foremost, as, as state leaders, we've really had to recognize that, um, that it is perfectly okay to have two letters on the same day that are both heartfelt saying exactly the opposite thing. One is saying open schools, my child needs to be in school. And the other is saying, close schools, keep them closed, how dare you, you're marching them to their death. And um, both are equally valid, um, both are equally emotional. And um, so really trying to wade through that and make decisions that are based on data, but also that allow parents to um, weigh uh, those different variables in their family and in their community has been really, really important. One thing that we saw last spring that we hadn't before was really high levels of parental engagement and parental interest. So building on that momentum and trying to keep that positive has been really, really important. And I think one of the best ways we've been able to do that as states is to work with our school districts and, um, and our, our private schools and our virtual school providers to really make choices available for parents. And um, you know, we've, we've heard it alluded to today that um, we've got an opportunity as a public education system to really to recreate a system that meets the needs of the public, not a box in which we, we expect the public to fit into. Thanks, Jillian. Hansel, living, uh, living right here in the district with you, you have a high level of parent engagement. Uh, Jillian talked about that. Can you talk a little bit about what's going on uh, in DC? Absolutely. So um, when uh, we were thinking about planning ahead for the 2021 school year, um, and this was early on in the summer when uh, the conditions were still uncertain, they were very much in flux, and it was not clear whether we were going to be opening you know, in a virtual posture or in a hybrid posture. Um, but what we step back to say is um, within my team and then as we talk to LEA, local education agencies and school leaders, educators and families, um, we all recognize that there are certain things we need to make sure our students have access to regardless of what the setting is and regardless of how the setting might fluctuate over the course of the year. And so we call those our guiding principles for continuous education, saying these are the things we have to figure out how to deliver, whether it's in person or in a hybrid or in a virtual atmosphere. Um, and we set out three pillars for what that continuous education needs to look like. Um, they included high expectations, equity and access, and the third pillar was around family engagement. Um, family engagement, of course, has always been critical in our schools, but it's even more critical now. Families have to be a more active partner than ever, and schools have to figure out how to make that happen. And so we've both been trying to figure out how we model that as the state education agency, but then also help our local education agencies and schools really prioritize that family voice. So when we developed these draft guiding principles, we shared them with a lot of people for feedback and specifically sought out feedback from family engagement organizations located in the, in the District of Columbia. And the main piece of feedback we heard from them was family engagement needs to mean not just clearly um, letting families know what they should expect this year, not just sharing you know, broad communication through robocalls or through weekly email newsletters, um, but really making sure there's space for two-way communication um, that families are asking or that schools are asking families, how is this experience going for you? Hearing that feedback and then showing how they're incorporating it um, because we are certainly all learning together and uh, we all know we will need to continue to grow and adapt to this moment. And so ensuring that um, there, that two-way communication exists uh, will help us all be able to keep the needs of our families front and center as we figure out how to do this better. Yeah, I think you raise a really important point, Hansel, about the two-way communication because uh, it, you know one of the things that's frustrating is that, that there's so much unknown, right? Like trying to predict um, months in advance. Um, and before we lived in a fairly predictable system of when things would happen and when school would open and when kids would be out of school and all of that. Um, can, can any of you talk about like the ways in which you're helping parents, students, district leaders deal with some uncertainty um, and maybe just some scaffolding for how you've provided um, guidance 
uh, to districts as they make those really difficult local decisions about whether you are in person, hybrid, or, uh, or uh, completely virtual. We, I'll just open it up. Okay. Uh, we made sure that we were, we immediately started uh, providing a daily update to our superintendents um, and teachers and everybody across the state. We had one massive listserv. So as we were getting information in, that information was going out and whatever they, we felt we were, we were hearing from teachers, we were hearing from leaders, this is what we need. Uh, we were hearing from parents. And I think the, the guidance we gave them uh, was we needed to let the local districts make those decisions. I've got a 148 districts in the state and um, what's good for the Northeast may not be good for the Southwest. And so we said, you know, survey your parents, find out from them what, what do they feel comfortable with? Do they feel comfortable with in person? Would they feel more comfortable virtually? And almost every single one of our districts gave our parents a choice. Mm -hmm. And so if they said we want virtual learning, then they set up virtual learning. I've got one district that literally set up a virtual school, K-12. So full teachers from around the district uh, for those parents that wanted their children to stay at home. And likewise, for those that were in person, um, they were right there ready to make sure that they had a safe uh, environment in which to, to learn and that the teachers felt safe. And I think that's another uh, important part, not just parents feeling safe, but staff feeling safe as well. Yeah, I, I would agree with Carrie and um, and in Wyoming, um, almost immediately, we had those same types of regular communications with different stakeholder groups, including our custodians, our school nurses, our superintendents, teachers, et cetera. Um, it still felt like I wasn't reaching everyone um, and that, that consistent messaging needed to come from my office, from the governor's office and from the state epidemiologist. So I did a series of what we call back to school bits where I just talked about the health orders or I talked about um, the, the framework guidance uh, that we gave as a state, which was the Smart Start guidance and how it was uh, developed by a group of parents, school board members, superintendents, teachers, and um, community members, and just really tried to kind of dispel um, myths and, um, and also just kind of quell any rumor mill by getting um, information out from the, the horse's mouth, so to speak. Um, so really consistent messaging from my office. Um, sometimes, you know, we had to course correct ourselves because we got information very quickly. We wanted to share it very quickly. And then we would have to redouble um, our efforts to correct information as more became available. Um, but, but at the same time, that's a teachable moment because that's exactly what we're expecting families and classrooms and school districts to do this year as well. Um, eventually, we'll all coalesce around some really great solutions and best practices that work in these situations. But until then, um, you know, maybe one of the most important messages that we give as state leaders is that course correction is not only okay, it's expected. I'll just add, I think one of the things we've thought about is um, how to help provide information and guidance in ways that feel digestible and meet people where they are, knowing that every single one of us, you know, ourselves as state chiefs, you were joking about this, Carissa, but I think it's so true, like every, ourselves, our teams, our school district leaders, our school leaders, our teachers, everybody um, is dealing with a lot and, and all of us can feel overwhelmed by the volume of information and new information we're trying to absorb in the changing circumstances. And so trying to think about how do we meet people where they are? How do we try and um, package the information we're delivering in ways that feel meaningful? So just um, with our health and wellness team, for example, that's a team within my agency, the State Education Agency, and we've partnered really closely with our Department of Health to think about how we provide health and safety guidance out to our schools and our child development facilities. And so, and we've figured out that we need to do that in a variety of ways. So there's the written guidance that is important um, and is detailed um, and is updated regularly and posted online. Um, but we accompany that with um, regular technical assistance calls and we try and match those to when we've issued new guidance, use part of that call to talk through some of that guidance live and then have a couple of practitioners, you know, talk about, you know, as I start at my school or in my child development facility that stayed open throughout the pandemic, here's how I've implemented that guidance and then have some discussion and Q&A. Um, and then also be able to, after that call, you know, both answer questions live, but also issue written FAQ documents. And just thinking about those different ways in which we need to share that information and help people digest and implement it. 
Yeah, it's really an important point, having been on the receiving end as a parent uh, and still trying to do a job, uh, which many people are. Um, it's, uh, it, you have about this much attention span to be able to read it and, and get it out there. So that digestible piece. And that's, and that's been a challenge always, right? To get information out. And now we have like a, a whole lot more information and a lot of changing information. And so it has definitely um, been a test and, and you all have spoken to like many ways in which you're working to do that. But I know that you're also working to improve that. One of the other uh, things that I know um, many of your colleagues and many of you have done is to work to have a learning management system or a system at the state level to coalesce around one platform or one way to deliver information rather than having multiple pieces of information coming in. Um, and I know too that you also care deeply about supporting teachers and district leaders uh, and keeping the quality of the instruction going, uh, regardless of how we're delivering. Can, Carrie, can you start out by talking to us about some of the ways in which you've done that in Mississippi? You mentioned the professional development that you were doing. What are some of the other ways? We, um, we've really doubled down on professional development with, in terms of also virtual right now, professional development. Uh, we got our input from our teachers. I've got a huge teacher advisory council about 400 teachers that advised me and I met with them during the spring and they they gave a lot of input about what they needed. We created a tremendous amount of resources for them to be able to use uh, to support distance learning and social emotional learning uh, and to also equip children to accelerate. We really focused on accelerating learning and not remediation. Remediation simply does not work and we wanted them to focus on grade level standards. Um, we created instructional planning guides for every grade level and every content content. Uh, we pushed those out to the districts. Uh, we created a, a whole list of culturally responsive books. We were trying to take listen to the, the nation and the nation's feelings around civil unrest. And so we really felt we needed to supply teachers with uh, materials that would be of high quality. We worked with our public broadcasting station um, to make sure that we had our teachers film, so we went out and grabbed the best of the best and had them do exemplary lessons. And we've now helped our PBS system to put up a second channel so that they have the ability then to go on and see high quality instruction um, happen all the time. So our, we're constantly seeking that input and Hans will set it. You, it's a two way piece. It's not just enough for us to sit here and think, this is what you need. It's to listen to our constituents and say, this is what we need. And then as a state agency, it was our job to get it done. Thanks, Carrie. Uh, Jillian, do you want to talk about the teaching and learning uh, work that you're doing in Wyoming? Yeah, I, I, I might just say that, um, you know, the, the pandemic has offered up many, many opportunities for us to um, either ignore or really use as a catapult to improve education. And um, I, I think every state is, is choosing uh, this opportunity to really grow their education system. So I'll touch on just a couple. Um, you mentioned the learning management system and I, I'm, I'm really proud in Wyoming. We were well on our way to having a statewide learning management system, not only for K-12, but also that we shared across all of higher education in Wyoming. So to have that in place and be able to build on that then with CARES funding has been, um, has been pretty profound. Um, you know, and, and we also are very focused on professional development, but the professional development doesn't look the same as it ever has. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about engaging students on um, a virtual platform. Um, we're, we're really targeting the, the master teachers who are having to shift platforms. And even though we're mostly in person in Wyoming um, for instruction right now, we know that it may not always be that way for every student. So we wanna make sure Sure that we just double down on this opportunity, um, the CARES Act funding to uh, to provide a more uh, personalized uh, learning experience for every student. Um, this this focus on essential learnings last spring has been a, a, a eureka moment for us. Um, we have very cumbersome sets of standards, content and performance standards, and we just mold over for years and years. It's too much, it's too much, how do we reduce it? And, um, you know, lo and behold, um, we did it. 
And so now we're really redoubling and trying to formalize some of those efforts that we made last spring to give our local schools a little more control so that we can focus less on these cumbersome content and, stand, um, content and performance standards and more on high quality curriculum and access to that curriculum. Yeah, that's really an important point. Both you and Carrie brought this up about, you know, we talked about lo what, what has been lost through this time, but there's many things that have been gained. It's made us rethink um, some of the things we thought were um, unmovable. Um, we've also offered uh, that professional development is accessible. Um, when before, like having it hosted in one place, someone may not be able to travel, may not be able to get there. But the accessibility piece is something that, you know, it, it should have, we should have known that, but it's really widened um, the net for folks. So, Hansel, do you want to talk a little bit about the quality that you guys are doing in DC? Yeah, I'll just add one thing um, that is a, an exciting new initiative we are um, planning to launch soon. Um, so we also have been offering a significant amount of professional development. We've really been thinking about how to support educators, not only on the instructional side, but also on um, the social emotional supports that we know our students need more than ever right now, um, and launched a, a new school climate page on our website with significant uh, resources and information there. Um, but one really new thing I'm excited about is a partnership that we um, expect to be able to enter into in, in the next uh in the next little bit uh, with Ed Research for Recovery. Um, this is an initiative coming out of the Annenberg Institute at Brown University um, in partnership with Results for America. I think it is a really interesting example of innovation where um, basically uh, these two organizations have gotten together with a group of education researchers and they've pushed them to distill you know, what is normally very dense and um, important research around what helps schools improve and, and teachers improve and distilled it down into quite succinct short briefs with literally bullet points of takeaways um, and really push them to to be clear about what they what the research says and what it says works and what it says doesn't work which is uh, really interesting and um, so I encourage anyone to go on their web page and, and look it up um, they've issued a number of these short briefs already um, looking at for example, schools uh, that recovered most quickly from Hurricane Katrina and uh, takeaways from sort of previous um, terrible experiences that our schools have had to grapple with. Um, and then the, the new initiative that we're really excited to, to take on, um, building on something that the Rhode Island Department of Education is actually doing with, with Ed Research um, for Recovery is um, convening a group of our LEA leaders to partner with Ed Research for Recovery. Um, and it, they'll bring on uh, researchers who will be able to talk through what that research looked like, give our LEA leaders some time to ask questions, but then most importantly, give them some time to talk to one another about how to apply that in this setting. Um, so it's bringing that idea of research much closer to practice, um, I think, than, than we normally get to do. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. That has been that's been one of those uh, things of taking this great research uh, and then applying it for the implementation. Um, and so that's a, a great resource. And so I'm going to come back to you. So we're, you know, it, some of the challenges uh, in the spring were pretty straightforward for us with schools completely closed across the country, we were not able to offer a, a statewide testing. Um, and so it made sense for all of us to say like, this just isn't, this just isn't possible. But we're in different places where there's, there's different uh, things going on in each state and the district. Um, and yet the important thing that I hear from all of you and all of your peers is that we still need transparency about where kids are. And we actually need it more now than ever. Um, to know where kids are, how we can uh, address the needs for them. But that may look a little different. We're still heading into the spring. We don't know exactly what that's going to look like. But what kind of flexibility do you think that we need? And, and how are you going to make sure that there's transparency so that you can direct resources and address needs for kids uh, in, in your district and state? I'll yeah, start. I think this is... Yeah, go ahead. I think this is such an important question um, and it's something certainly that we are still um, actively grappling with and, and don't have final decisions around. Um, but uh, as you said, I think the critical thing is to have the information we need so that we can best support students both at an individual level and then also at a, a sort of system-wide level. 
Um, at an individual level, you know, I, I hear from um, advocates for students with disabilities and from English learner experts about just how important it is to have ongoing data and information to be able to serve our students. Um, and if we are able to go forward with statewide assessments this spring, you know, it'll be the first time in two years that we'll have clear data um, where all of our students are, um, which is just a really long time to go. Um, and so we are certainly exploring options that are uh, creative in ways that we never anticipated having to do, including potentially remote testing options um, or hybrid options that will utilize a, a variety of in-person and remote settings. Um, so we're looking into sort of what that may look like. Um, but for us, it, it is important to explore and important to consider because we need to know where our students are in order to help them improve from there. Um, and I think parents are deeply interested in this even more so than ever before. One of the important things we've done in DC is issue really um, detailed individual student score reports coming out of our statewide assessments that not only say whether a student is proficient or not, um, but includes their scale score, includes uh, on the English language arts test how they did on the sections about reading fiction versus reading nonfiction, and on the reading sections versus the writing sections. And those score reports have always been important, um, but feel more important than ever. And so we're really also thinking about how we can make sure that those reports get in the hands of parents and how we can help parents um, understand and unpack those reports um, if we are able to go forward so that we're all making the best meaning possible out of, out of what we're able to do. Yeah, Jillian, the vast majority of your schools are actually open in person in Wyoming. And so this may be a different uh, conversation for you. What are, what are you thinking in Wyoming? Yeah, you know, uh, just, just two things to add to what Hansel said, um, which was, was spot on um, in terms of, of how we are also approaching um, assessment and accountability uh, and, and their importance um, even during this time. Um, you know, I, I think one of the most important things we can do in in-person or virtual um, instruction right now is to make sure that our teachers are well equipped and well informed about the power of formative assessments to drive instruction and interventions as needed. So um, we know, you know, that, that that sometimes is a bit easier on in when students are in person. So we want to make sure um, you know, that we're supporting our teachers across the state um, as best we can to provide, um, to, to just uh, make sure that they're formatively assessing and intervening uh, um, with students the earlier the better. The other point that maybe I'd just make uh, regarding the importance, uh, recently in an interview, Dr. Scott Marion uh, noted that we have to assume that students during this assessment period this year will have access to Google and a calculator. And frankly, that's where we should be heading with assessment anyway. Um, you know, we want students to demonstrate their thinking, not just their ability to recall. Um, we've thought about that for a long time. Uh, and, and again, maybe the pandemic is one more opportunity to uh, recognize the disruption that we have and grow as an entire assist, uh, system with respect to assessment there. Yeah, absolutely. Carrie, how are you thinking about this in Mississippi? Well, we're definitely intending to administer our statewide assessments and we're looking to the experts. Um, we've got a technical advisory committee that is just absolutely amazing. Um, Dr. Chris Domaleski chairs that for us and he's the, the number two at the Center for Assessment. So we're in good hands in terms of guidance. I don't, I don't expect it to look exactly to Hansel's point, you know, like it's been, that it's looked in the past, but um, we definitely, as I've been saying over and over again, we need to get a handle on the state of the state of education uh, in, 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 the, in the state of Mississippi so that we're better able to help our teachers and help our children. Um, that being said, sometimes we lump assessment and accountability all in the same word and uh, same sentence. And I do think we need to be thinking about decoupling uh, accountability this year. I would, I would hope that we could get some flexibility around that. Fully intend to administer our statewide assessments. That's going to give me the information that I need in order to better provide the resources that I need for teachers and for children and families. But definitely thinking that we need to separate the two, the accountability part of it, uh, from the assessment part of it. And, and so that's, we're hoping to get some flexibility there. Yeah. 
I think I, I wanted to start from a point to what that Hansel bro, brought up about uh, students with disabilities and, and English language learners. We, we use those tests in such important ways to know how to deliver service, not only for them, but for everyone. And so um, there's, a, there's a real need for information. And so I think it's this parsing between having good information, being able to deliver and meet the needs, uh, and then determining how we utilize that kind of level of transparency um, is still is still a bit evolving, uh, evolving thing at this point. So my panelists have been so good at uh, being brief today. We talked about this, and so I will invite any of you who are in the audience if you'd like to submit a question and answer or questions. We'll work on answering. I have a few more questions that I'm going to keep going on, but feel free to pop some things in the Q and A. Um, and if we have time, we'll get to those. Um, I, the next topic that I wanted to chat with you all about, and many of you have brought this up as we've gone along, is the social and emotional needs of, of students. And we've talked um, a lot about the conditioning, which, uh, Jillian, this was your platform as the, the president of CCSSO this year, which got a little bit uh, disrupted, I guess is the best way to say, but it it matters even more now. We talked about, you know, meal service, but the social and emotional needs and the wellness of kids. Um, can you just talk a little bit about like how you've really doubled down on that uh, in Wyoming? Yeah, you know, um, it sounds cliche to say this is what keeps me up at night, but I'm being incredibly literal when I say this is what keeps me up at night. Um, nationwide and in every single state and um, territory in Washington, D.C., we saw an immediate decline in the number of reports of maltreatment of students. Um, they're coming back to school. Uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, everyone is grappling with their own variables and trade-offs personally as families, as communities, and children are not accepted from that. Um, every single child is coming back with um, a degree of, of trauma uh, as a result of COVID-19 and um, going to school one day last spring and not coming to school the next day um, and for many months to come. So, um, you know, I, I think that's a, a really stark starting point for social emotional learning um, for all of us. And in Wyoming, um, you know, one of one of my commitments is to make sure that we have more than just social workers and counselors and law enforcement um, and mental health providers uh, able to identify and intervene um, with social emotional issues that our students are coming to school with. So we have the well-being, but we also have a lot of intervening that we need to do. Um, we'll be utilizing some of our CARES Act set aside to uh, help set up more structures for that. Um, I've also reached out to our federal delegation on this issue, and I'm hoping that as a nation, we can really think, rethink about um, sort of this, this one leg of schools being the main reporter or the main vehicle for reports of student maltreatment. And um, so again, it is, um, you know, is something that has literally kept me and many of my colleagues awake at night thinking about, you know, okay, students are fed. We're really happy about that, but we know students aren't safer at home when school is their safe place to be and they can't be there. Yeah, Carrie, I'm going to come to you and we're getting a couple questions around the social and emotional needs. One is, uh, and I'll just ask you guys to build into the question that I originally asked, which was, how can SEL support the next frontier for workforce prep or C uh, CTE? And then also, um, uh, you mentioned the telehealth. Uh, Carrie, I believe. Um, so that, build that into, because uh, they're asking about rural areas in Wyoming and Mississippi. So I'll come back. That, to that. that is one Sorry. reason that we really wanted to um, build in uh, with our digital learning plan, the, the whole idea of expanding telehealth and telemedicine. And we have a lot of areas of our state where we don't have enough doctors, quite honestly. We don't have enough pediatricians. And we certainly don't have enough mental health therapists in our state. So we want to be able to figure out a way that whether it's a parent that needs that help or whether it's a teacher that needs that help or a student that needs that help, that we can expand these sites across our state and also get 
to give more access to, to children and families and, and teachers uh, if they are experiencing um, issues around social emotional um, health. We just now put out our, um, our social emotional learning standards. Uh, that is being launched, couldn't be more timely. Uh, we're excited about that. Uh, we're gonna be working with our teachers on how to embed that and, and what they're doing each and every day. Uh, and we're encouraging schools to be really proactive about reaching out to children. I've said to everybody, you need to account for every child. So if they're not there and they need, you need to reach out and touch. My teacher advisory council was telling me about meeting kids one-on-one -on -one with Zoom or making individual calls or some teachers are even driving right to children's homes just to check to make sure that they're okay. So I think everybody needs to realize that we're in a different place and when they're not sitting in front of you, uh, you need to find out where they are and more importantly, how they are. Hansel, I'm gonna to come to you at the end and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a whip around. So I'm gonna have you answer two questions in one here at Social Emotional. And I'm gonna ask you guys to, to envision this disruption has given us an opportunity for what the future looks like for education. If we think about modernizing education, what's your, what's your take on that? What's your final word on that? Hansel? Yeah, so on social emotional learning, what I would say is I think this is such an important area. It was important pre-pandemic and it's all the more important now. And I think we can't think about it separately from the academic instruction that happens. Um, so, you know, in one of these research briefs I was talking about, I think one of the findings coming out of Hurricane Katrina was that schools that had strong school climates actually recovered from learning loss faster than those that didn't, right? And so these, these things are tied together in our students' experience. Um, on our youth risk behavior survey results, um, we see um, a correlation between other indicators of student wellness and um, the percentage of students who report they have a meaningful relationship with an adult in the building. It doesn't have to be a teacher, it can be any adult. And so in this virtual environment, thinking about how we still ensure those strong and robust relationships for students with adults in their lives um, is, is so important. And at the same time, that alone isn't enough. Um, I think about how under ESSA, we, one of the schools we had identified as in the bottom 5% of performance in DC um, had done a student focus group early on in their planning work. And what one of these um, focus group uh, participants said, a student said was, look, I actually do feel loved and valued by the adults in this building. They care about us and we know it but I had a long-term substitute for months in my math class last year, and I want to learn math. I think that matters, you know? And so we're hearing it from our students. They need both. They need adults who care about them and they want to learn. And we, we need to think about those two things hand in hand. Um, when it comes to innovation, what I would say is, I do think there are tactical things we've all learned. Um, I think telehealth is a great one. We moved in DC to delivering all of our Part C services um, for infants and toddlers with developmental delays through a telehealth model very quickly. Um, and that's been a really powerful forward step. Um, and we're thinking about how we might continue that in the future for families who value and appreciate that um, even when in-person services can resume. Uh, but I also think about sort of more um, things like, um, what it means to have families have so much more of an intimate knowledge of what school looks like and what that might mean for partnerships between families and educators for the future. Um, so that's not always the kind of thing we think of when we think of innovation, but I think that's going to be really powerful when we think about what school can look like uh, going forward. Thanks, Hansel. Quick sound bite, Carrie and then Jillian. Yeah, I, I'm really excited actually about the future. I think this has given us an opportunity to really do something very, very innovative in our state. We've got a teacher shortage and we do around the nation. So we're planning on picking some of our best and brightest around the state to teach lessons in other parts of our state that don't have teachers, that don't, they can't find the teachers. And so this, we have the ability then to bring high quality instruction to every single classroom around the state. Uh, and so we're going to be using the technology that we have and looking to innovate even further. Uh, but this is an exciting time for us so that we can ensure that every teacher or in every child has an outstanding teacher. Thank you. Jillian. And mine is going to be outside of the realm of what's happening in schools and I'll talk just really quickly soundbite about our um, state education agencies that all of us as state chiefs oversee, um, medium to large uh, state agencies, and we've reworked to better support school districts through this. Um, I think that's a really wonderful leverage point for all of us as um, quote unquote bureaucrats or politicians or leaders or whatever we're going to call ourselves. Um, we all have really amazing people in our state education agencies 
We've all leveraged them differently throughout this pandemic, and I'm excited about the opportunities to continue to leverage SEA staff differently to support school districts and students. Thanks, Jillian. And I'm gonna get us in under the wire. I'm just gonna say thank you again to the Reagan Institute. And when we think about the future, the modernizing of education, uh, the chiefs have been discussing now weekly, uh, we think a lot about the equity and access issue. It's been uh, top of mind for all of us. Uh, and we worked really hard on that. We think about the student-centered learning that we've been able to capture. And we think about keeping it at high quality and having transparency so we know that all students are being served. Thank you again for joining us today.